These are America's astronauts. They are modern day spacemen and women. They fly into space aboard the space shuttle. They may be pilots, scientists, or engineers. By the time they're ready for liftoff, they've spent a lot of time in training. Shuttle pilots have to spend many hours flying training aircraft in order to stay in practice. Uh, my name is Eileen Collins, and I'm an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. I'm currently training to fly on STS-63, which is a space shuttle flight scheduled for February of 1995. We've never had a woman fly in the right seat of the space shuttle as a space shuttle pilot. Well, as a shuttle pilot, we need to keep up our proficiency in between uh, shuttle flights and before our first shuttle flight. Predominantly, we fly the T-38. We fly about, oh, 10 times a month. I'm keeping your hands on the stick and throttles. When I first decided I wanted to be an astronaut, it was such a far off, wild dream. I was, I was embarrassed to tell anybody that I wanted to do it. Um, of course, back then, as a youngster, uh, there were only men astronauts. It is too expensive to teach pilots how to fly the shuttle by using the actual spacecraft. They must learn in a simulator. This is a machine specially designed to look and feel like the inside of a shuttle cockpit. Here they practice what to do if something goes wrong during a flight. Now when we do the simulator training, we have an astronaut crew in the actual simulator itself. We have a training crew which is, which is down at the console, and they have a script that they have written ahead of time on a list of malfunctions that they're gonna input into the simulator. And then we have flight controllers over in Mission Control, and they don't know what kind of malfunctions are coming. And the astronaut crew doesn't know what's coming. Okay, we're in flight control room one. We're about to start an integrated simulation. We're about to launch Discovery. Copy and look at that. Roger roll, Discovery. So what you do is you, you launch and you immediately start getting malfunctions. And what the pilot needs to do, and the commander and the mission specialist, is identify what is wrong. And that's that's difficult. Captain Leak's going in. Left engine helium. Holler when you're out of the procedure. Mr. Eileen, we see a leak on the left engine helium. Go for the procedure. In training, they pound on us incessantly. But after a while, you even get used to an environment where there are uh, uh, 20 or 30 malfunctions an hour coming at you, and you get used to it. If Discovery Houston, main engine limits inhibit, stuck in the bucket. You cannot simulate that pressure, and the way we make up for it in training is to put in a large number of problems, which leads to the same kind of feelings of pressure that you get on a real flight day when maybe one thing is not working exactly right. So. One IMU right now. See it close out. Yeah. It's starting to clean up a little now. It's not looking too bad. Now they survived at this more or less, let them land. Crews come back laughing. They say if you can survive the simulators, the space flight itself is a dream. <laughs> when they are in orbit, the astronauts are weightless. They spend a lot of time preparing for that feeling so that they will be able to live and work in that unusual environment. And even if you had all the money in the world, you cannot simulate zero gravity. <laughs> so, and that oftentimes presents the biggest challenges when you get up there, is dealing with that and operating in that environment. Flight prep. Everything takes longer to do when you first get up there, whether it be going to the bath bathroom or preparing and eating your meal or ex getting ready to exercise on a, on a bicycle that we carry up there or, or anything. If I'm sitting here in this room and I were to drop a pencil, I would begin looking on the floor and the tops of the tables and the tops of the chairs in the room, but in zero gravity, the pencil could be floating right here behind my head and I could spend you know, minutes looking for it until some other crewmate says, well, turn and look, it's right there.
Sleeping up there is really pleasant. They advertise water beds as being so good because there are no pressure points. Well, in zero gravity, there are absolutely no pressure points. <laughs> and it's, uh, you, know, and you can just close your eyes and drift off uh, very, very easily. Okay, we'll check. The shuttle lands like a glider, that is, without power. That means that the crew will have only one chance at a successful landing, no chance to pull out and go around again. Much of the pilot's training involves landing methods, and they use a plane which has been fixed to fly like the shuttle. The aircraft is a highly modified Gulfstream II, flies almost exactly like the space shuttle. Uh, the performance has been modified so it descends like the space shuttle the same descent rate, the same type of drag. It's very, very important training for shuttle pilots because the shuttle is a very difficult aircraft to fly. And it's very different from any other airplane that I've flown in my life. It doesn't have engines when it comes back to Earth. It sinks like a brick. An instructor gets the plane up to about 35,000 feet, then puts the engines in reverse. The plane starts to go down at a rate of about four miles a minute. Another sight the astronauts see is the effect of air friction on the outside of the shuttle during landing. Parts of the fuselage become very hot. Two former astronauts describe the experience. It was really like flying inside of a neon tube. We were looking out uh, through there, and all of a sudden this glow started at about 300,000 feet. There's this nice, soft uh, orange light that uh, surrounds the, uh, the vehicle. Uh, it doesn't look all that hot, but it's there because it is hot. We're sure looking at uh, two to 3,000 degrees right outside the window. It was awesome and uh, very impressive. On launch day, it is a different scene at the pad. Normally, you're used to arriving at the pad and finding all these workers, you know, scurrying all over the place, readying the vehicle for flight or readying the pad. And suddenly, you get out there and there's just the six of you on the crew and the six members of the team that are going to help strap you in and do the final hatch closing. And that's it. When liftoff begins, first the main engines start. They're located at the rear of the orbiter and they burn liquid oxygen and hydrogen that are coming from the giant external fuel tank. Six seconds later, the two booster rockets, which burn solid fuel, come on. And that six seconds seemed to last for an eternity because um, the vibration was so high, you could feel the shuttle just straining against the launch pad. You just, you think it's going to shake itself apart, and uh, let's hurry up and light solid rocket motors. Come on, come on, let's go, and then uh, bang at zero when the solids light. When those kick on, you're going to go somewhere. Uh, the shuttle will not stay at the pad. Our launch is very fast. It's basically vibrations and noise. The vibration was so tremendous inside the cockpit that those gauges kind of blurred. It was like, well, it's a good thing I've trained so long to study these gauges, I can't read them now. <laughs> In the space of about a minute and 45 seconds, we're traveling faster than the fastest rifle bullet. After two minutes and 12 seconds, uh, you're off the sounds and you're onto, onto the main engines. That's a smooth ride. It is a bit of a relief to know that they're gone. <laughs> and uh, you figure that sh the main engines have been working just fine for two minutes, no reason they shouldn't for another six. <laughs> so you you're feeling pretty good at that point. It takes approximately eight minutes of powered flight from liftoff until the shuttle reaches 17,500 miles an hour, the speed necessary to go into orbit. When the main engines cut off, the G-forces drop to zero, and the crew becomes weightless. <laughs> it's, I, you know, it's euphoria on board. It's euphoric. It's just the whole crew who lets up a cheer. And before getting down to work, the astronauts take a few minutes to admire the view. <laughs> 